Hi, Rick. Hello, everyone. Hi. Hi, Monica. Good evening. Hello. Good evening. Good morning. <laughs> so let us take a moment of silence and in the meantime, others may also join. So, yeah, a moment of silence. Sorry, yeah. So we had finished uh, page seven and we have to begin the new passage today. The method and process of integral yoga. For those of us who have the hard copy, it's page eight. So let us start. Anyone who feels ready and would like to read this uh, paragraph for all of us. The one in front, the method and process of integral yoga. I'll start. Yeah, please. Yes. It is always through something in the lower that we must rise into the higher existence. And the schools of yoga each select their own point of departure or their own gate of escape. But the normal action of nature in us is an integral movement in which the full complexity of all our elements is affected by and affects all our environments. The whole of life is the yoga of nature. The yoga that we seek must also be an integral action of nature. And the whole difference between the yogin and the natural man will be this, that the yogin seeks to substitute in himself for the integral action of the lower nature working in and by ego and division. The yogin seeks to substitute the integral action of the higher nature working in and by God and unity. If indeed our aim be only an escape from the world to God, synthesis is unnecessary and a waste of time. For then, our sole practical aim must be to find out one path out of the thousand that lead to God, one shortest possible of shortcuts, and not to linger exploring different paths that end in the same goal. But if our aim be a transformation of our integral being into the terms of God existence, it is then that a synthesis becomes necessary. Thank you.
so i think the first thing that like a consolation if i can say comes here to me is that we don't have to get frustrated uh, looking at the lower in us because the lower precisely is the raw material for the yoga so in the first line he says it is always through something in the lower that we must rise into the higher existence and uh, that's the fun as mother says that that's the adventure the souls plunged into you know they plunged into existence knowing that it is a dark abyss and also knowing that we are all divine beings and we can transform this complete darkness to complete light absolute light so that solid faith with which the souls mother says jumped into existence especially for adventure and for those of us who you know stay close to the path for a long time we slowly begin to also uh, get apart from only getting frustrated we begin to enjoy the process because then it's not frustrating again and again to see the lower it's just like a challenge you know like an adventure if we go into a forest and there are trails where we you know have to use our mind a bit you know use our intuition a bit which path to take which not to take you know so it's adventure and adventurous people like such kind of trails they usually would not take the trails which are already mapped out for the fun of adventure so here in the first line for me this comes out that uh, for this reason knowing that from the lower we have to move forward to the higher and then we don't need to be so frustrated about the lower seeing it in ourselves you know, because it rises of course it is there all the time along with the higher it's also there and the schools of yoga each select their own point of departure or their own gate of escape so as uh, Sri Aurobindo at other places also he shares about the path of the materialist. For example, in the beginning, we have been reading in Life Divine the path of ascetic, the path of materialist. So the materialist is denying the spirit, saying that no, only you know matter is the truth, and uh, ascetic is uh, want, wanting to say that uh, no, you know matter is so dark, we can't really you know, we live a suffocated life if we stay with the matter. so go beyond matter and rise into the spirit and abandon matter for example and sri aurobindo so beautifully is walking with us holding our hands to show us that no no neither this has to be negated not this they want to convey this some truth to us which has to be synthesized so yeah anything here anyone first three lines every now and then i find shri orbindo puts in a little a little poke at <clears throat> the concept of escaping into nirvana and leaving the world as it is unchanged other than one person has escaped and i see one little element to this here and i smile each time yes yeah very shortly uh this reminds me you know there was this thing i saw about surdas ji he is again you know he was an indian mystic and he had i mean he was blind so he was very popular for his singing that i mean he had a very melodious voice and he used to sing really beautiful bhajans the spiritual songs so one day a very popular guru he came specially to surdas to hear him sing but then you know surdas just kept thinking about just how small he is you know i mean it was a beautiful sound it was beautiful everything and yet the words that he was using was like you know i am this and i am this and i am this you know just the lower parts and you are the one who's out there so then the guru said that you know i'm un, i'm he stopped him in between and he said i'm so sorry 
I thought, you know, I heard so much about you, but I just see you being identified with your smallness, which is good to see. But now, Surdas, you rise, right? You are that. So I think, again, knowing that we are starting from the lower and yet knowing that I am that, you know, that bridge, that thing also has to be there because sometimes we have a tendency to just, I don't know, get some rasa out of the lower. So just that thing that rem always remembering, I am this and that. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely, yes, yes. I think both are traps. And yeah, to be wary of the trap, because I was talking to a friend who said that, you know, I have been having these realizations, you know, stabilizing myself as awareness. But then he said that uh, when I venture out in the world, I feel a bit afraid that what if my peace is destabilized? And I said that, uh, don't you want to test for yourself? How stable is this realization? And if in the thought, with the thought of entering into the world, you feel that the peace is shakeable, what kind of a peace have you realized? So very important, yeah, to be wary of both things. Thank you. Yeah, Sharda ji, you were sharing something? Yeah, uh, Monica, I just want to, you know, uh, I, I, I didn't understand the uh, meaning of this third line, you know, and the schools of yoga each select their own point of departure or their own gate of escape. What is that meaning? What is the meaning of that? Yeah, would anyone like to shed light upon this? Well, I, I can, uh, I think he refers to the different yogas like bhakti or jnana or karma like they take some part of us like our heart the bhakti the, the feelings the emotions to to rise them to god uh, or the 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 jnana yoga utilizes our our mind our the, the upper mind so these different uh, aspects of yoga or these different paths just take one aspect of ourself to to rise and he's talking about the need for a synthesis so, something like that yeah thank you so much yeah uh, so i would just can i say something yes yeah. so so i would I, what i understand it that it means that there are different paths to reach to the same destination. The, the ultimate goal is yoga, union, mm -hmm. and union with the, the divinity within us, the, the realization and, and the evolution, the transcendence to the, from lower to the higher nature. So there can be various, various journeys that we can undertake and yoga also, you know, there is a tool and also a goal. So as a tool, it can be, there can be various mm -hmm. paths that yes. just as mm -hmm. just now mm -hmm. mentioned mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. bhakti, jnana, there are so many, so many paths, and, but they ultimately they all reach the same point. So that is what I understand, Monica. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, anyone else? Anything at these three lines? Okay, so I'm moving further. But the normal action of nature in us is an integral movement in which the full complexity of all our elements is affected by and affects all our environments. The whole of life is the yoga of nature. So I think uh, by this time, um, I'm sure all of us who are here would know that how complex is our being. You know, there is, uh, as mother says, there are contradictory wills present in us, contradictory personalities. One wants something higher, the other not yet. 
you know, the one wants to rise up, the other wants to still have some more of rest. Not yet, not yet, you know, I'm okay right now. So like this, we like walk one step and then maybe five behind, then walk one more, two behind. But as Sri Aurobindo says, that with our stumblings, the world is perfected. So nothing goes waste. I think that's the beauty, that nothing is going waste. Even with the stumblings, all the errors, no matter how slow is the movement, how many detours we can take, doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's a win-win situation, ultimately. But as Mother says, let's collaborate. So here he shares, but the normal action of nature in us is an integral movement, one which considers all the parts of the being into attention. It's not neglecting any part of the being. And that's why we see, I feel I, I can connect it with evolution of consciousness through all the different forms that it goes through. You know, that it's everything is changes, changing integrally. Whole of like from a stone, if a plant comes, you know, uh, the nature has done this process of evolution. You see the suppleness in a plant. You know, you see the feelings mother shares about the consciousness that plants are conscious. You know, you can talk with them. So it's like a whole movement along with the physical. The physical has also changed the feeling part. You know, mental has not yet developed, but it's like a progressive thing. And nature is taking everything into consideration. So she, uh, he shares that it's an integral movement in which the full complexity of all our elements is affected by and affects all our environments. The whole of life is the yoga of nature. So whether, as mother shares, you know, whether it's consciously, unconsciously, the yoga is happening. We may not be aware. In, in the beginning, we remain a lot, even I don't know how many lifetimes we remain con in ignorance. Although layers of ignorance are being shed, but still it's a blindness that we carry. And the blindness is so great that we don't even know that we are blind. Such great is the blindness. If a person knows that I am blind and I need help, then that blindness is, you know, it's like, I would say a little less degree of blindness because he knows that I am blind. But we don't even know that we are blind. We think that we see, don't I see this? You know, I see that that person insulted me, don't I see that? And we think that we are seeing. And that's why we have been asked by the masters to not to believe into the senses. Because as long as we remain in the sense mind, we will be deluded. So we will have to believe less and less in our sense mind, so as to go beyond uh, and get an illumined mind so that it can work with more of a truth consciousness rather than this limited sense perception, sense mind, which always have a very little picture, as a very little picture. The yoga that we see again talking of integral yoga i believe that yoga that we seek must also be an integral action of nature referring to all the movements i would say you know thought feeling sense perceptions including everything as one was sharing earlier that no part is left behind but must be an integral action of nature and the whole difference between the yogin and the natural man will be this that the yogin seeks to substitute in himself for the integral action of the lower nature working in and by ego and division the integral action of the higher nature working in and by god and unity so as i think what taru was pointing at earlier that we mostly identify with our limited self I am mostly identified with my thoughts, my opinion, my idea, my story of life, very limited, very, very limited self. So this is living by the ego and the division that I am this, I end here, you start there. So you are something separate than me. So this is the basic division that we mostly operate from. And he shares now what has to be done if this integral perfection has to be manifested in our lives then he says 
now this has to be replaced by integral action of the higher nature working in and by god and unity so as mother is sharing in prayers and meditations you know she is again and again disidentifying for the from the surface consciousness and she is identifying more and more a union with the higher consciousness you know, so mother in lower nature praying to the mother in higher nature that may i become the may i have a complete union with thee so that that light can shine and each part each thought each feeling each sense perception only is there for the divine work there is no else no other purpose that i may live for we see this sadhana you know beautifully in mother's prayers and meditations so this has to happen otherwise uh, as Shurubindu at other points he shares that if we want true harmony in our houses, in world, in nations, in at workplaces, in within ourselves, if we want true harmony without the action of truth consciousness, supramental consciousness, forget about it. Because the sense mind only sees this much. I am not able to understand what you are saying. Why? Because I see only this much. How how do I you know, know more? How can I step into your shoes? And even if I step into your shoes, now there are 10 others who, in whose shoes I can't step. What to do about this separation? And that's why the importance of uniting with our higher self. And as you know, it was pointed earlier, to disidentify from our suffocated self and to identify more and more with the higher self. Expanded, wide version of ourselves. Yeah, anything here? Okay, yes, it's fan. Thank you. Yeah, you know, this realization that I am not, right? Like, uh, can, you, can you repeat? Can you come again, please? I said this realization that I am not one, I am many. You know how it says that there are so many movements in me, but I mostly ignore a lot of them. I put a lot. I want a specific appearance, a specific picture. Is my connection unstable? Can you hear me? Yes, yes. It is a bit uh, cracking. Yeah. Although we are able to hear, but it's cracking. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so I was just saying that for me, the acceptance and the realization that yes, you know how they talk about the bad wolf and the good wolf, the white or the dark wolf, you know how there's that story that yes, it's not that I'm 80% the white wolf and 20% the dark wolf, you know, I could be 50-50, it's just that I want to hide the dark wolf and I want to just show the white wool. So it's not about appearances. It's not about showing because in those hidings, the purification just stays where it is, right? The purification doesn't happen. So if somebody was to come to a house who's very good natured and happy, you know, we see that energy shift in our house. Suddenly everybody is happy. And if somebody comes who's like, you know, who do you don't want to be around, the whole house, the atmosphere, goes down. I think similarly in us, you know, when we know that how this interplay is working and when I'm, say, if I'm in gratitude, I just cannot have complaints, right? Like I am unable to complain. And if I'm complaining, I cannot be grateful. So just knowing which wolf to feed, realizing that yes, it's active, it happens in me. It's a fact of my existence right now. So choosing and moving accordingly yeah that's what i wanted to say yeah yeah absolutely and as uh, you know alokda in his talks he talks about deva and asur in us like the gods and the titan in us and at every moment there is a choice who to feed as you said who to put in front yeah absolutely And usually we are found defending our titans. <laughs> so if we have suffered enough, the misery of defending the titan side, 
then we will have to consciously uh, put the psychic in front as mother says or put the deva in front put the gods in front yes and slowly also you know with uh, with with a kind of how you would uh, make understand a child you know why is it not good for you you know why you you must not eat this you know lollipop or whatever so like that i think with affection with love the titans have to be kind of you know cajoled coaxed in for their betterment as alugda also shares that nobody else was able to take care of the titans but the mother the divine mother since gods are also the child of the divine and titans are also the child of the divine mother only the divine mother had that much of compassion that she came and that did the process of slaying the asura and you know taking them from their hiding you know come out come out you know, talk to me and then in the slaying actually they get moksha or liberation from being a titan so only the divine mother and the divine mother is present in us as love so with love if we look at each movement of the being and we see the futility of remaining dark then slowly we rise yes yeah anyone else anything more at this mother says that like a forcep i'm sure many of us may have read this uh, few lines of the mother you know she says like you should be very conscious of what's happening in you and just like you know very carefully with the forcep she says this two you know points going down and pick that ugliness out which is hiding you know pick that ill will out you know here you are you know, putting that in front and uh, not listening its dictates now anymore not feeding as you were sharing not feeding it anymore so knowing first of all as she says that become conscious of each and every ripple in you each thought should be passing in front of your light the light of consciousness each feeling goes in this front of light and then you can pick out you know then you can like an artist is very sincerely looking at the art and saying okay maybe this mistake here and that mistake there so like that she says that we have to observe ourselves and with discernment we have to walk the path because if i am not looking at myself as an artist how would the movement happen towards more and more beauty yeah please anyone the yeah, one thing that just uh, came to me on this is that lot of times we feel that looking at something means debating it mentally oh this movement what do i do where did it come what do i do for this oh my god why is it here it still came back i thought i'm done with it you know that again just takes us again and again in loops so when we are looking at something just accepting it's there and sometimes and most of the times especially if we are able to hold things slightly the solution could be just letting it be there and it will go by itself you know all the time picking up a sword and wanting to run after it to fight with it it's mostly never the solution it feels it is but you know the mind has its own thing and yeah yeah absolutely yes priyanka yes that's what i saw i so i so identify with and understand what you said taru i so uh, truly agree with you that howsoever we try and mentally try to do anything uh, it it is it is you we might be aware like just giving a simple example that we all know that we should not be angry but when a situation comes how it's so if we are so conditioned to react to a certain situation it just happens for some people when it happens they are able to control it then for some people when they have totally done you know it's so totally destruction has happened it's much later maybe a day later they are able to realize it and for a very few even when the anger is coming they are able to control it and not give in to that anger now that is a power of 
that is within us, but it needs to be awakened. Just, just like a seed, we are all like seeds. And within a seed, just as within a seed, there is that whole tree or a plant, but it is not visible. You see the seed, but that has a potentiality of becoming a complete thing, a tree, only that it has to be given the right environment, like the soil, the sunlight, the water. And when that happens, that seed automatically blossoms into a tree or a plant or whatever. The same is for us. All of us are a seed. We have to provide that environment to our own self. But for how? You know, we talk about this, that ye nahi karna chahiye, wo nahi karna chahiye, pyar, love. We, love is who we are. We don't have to, it is there. We have to just figure it out within ourselves. But how? Where, what should we do to be able to figure out? You know, and just as you said, Monica, you too, and Taru, you too, just, you know, okay, simple things like even doing good actions, even if we do this good action, automatically we are awakening some positivity within us. That positivity is the divinity that it's a vicious cycle. You do a good act, you awaken the divine power, the goodness within you, that grows and makes you do something more, more good. And it goes on and on and on. So, you know, whatever we are aiming towards, wherever our journey has to take us, ultimate goal is whatever, but the path is just simple that keep doing goodness, something good. Do good as just as Gita, uh, Bhagwan Krishna has also said in Gita. And Sri Aurobindo and Sri Ma all the time talking about that the purpose of this life is just to first perfect your work on your own self, perfect your own self. And it shouldn't end just there. You know, it should go beyond yourself. So if you are able to think beyond our own self, think goodness about others around us, that in itself, a simple thing, you know, that in itself will awaken that power and that vicious cycle we will be able to create Next time some challenging situation comes in our life, our mind will automatically, will, will be, we are empowering our own self. The mind gets empowered to take that situation in a positive way, the worst of the worst situation. You will be able to see, we will be able to see positivity in that. But we have to provide, uh, we have to help our own self. And the simple thing is to start with some good act, some goodness. So. Just this little thought came to my mind. Hi. Um, yeah. Thank you, Priyanka. Yes. In the, yes, Claudia. Uh, in the, um, but it's in the beginning, the whole of life is in the yoga of nature. I mean, I just get stuck there, you know, I was like, I didn't hear anymore <laughs> because I didn't understand. I mean, the whole of life is the yoga of nature and then it, this was speaking about nature, the lower, and the so. And then you are telling that if we are not grateful, we are in complaining, and if we are in grateful, we don't complain. Like this polarity, yes. Yeah, and some sometimes I feel like in my negative polarity. Uh, and I think it's good to have this negative polarity sometimes because uh, if we don't have this negative polarity, we don't, we are kind of don't arrange anything in our life. Like if we don't see the hole in the ceiling of our house, then we're never going to arrange it because everything is so right. Yes. So, I think this is yoga, no? It's to balance, like you are telling. So, for this reason, they say the whole of life is the yoga of nature, because nature is always balancing. I mean, we see the four stations, uh, spring, summer, autumn, and winter. I mean, they have polarities, but they always like 
kind of bring balance to to the earth in different ways. I mean, I don't know if I understand in this kind of just. Yeah, no, I think beautiful windows uh, and thank you, Claudia. So by yoga of nature, I uh, one thing that I see here is that if we see the whole process of evolution happening by itself, as a consciousness, we have grown from stone, which is dark, rigid, you know, hard, total abyss, one can say, seems like, to a supple movement like a plant, insects, animals, higher animals, developing mind, feelings, intelligence, monkeys, chimpanzees, so-called our ancestors, you know, all the in between species of man. So this is the yoga of nature. What is you, uh, nature trying to do? The nature is trying to bring the divinity out of that stone into the forefront so that it becomes palpable. So if we see this happening, we will see, oh, what is this nature performing? What is this trying to do? Oh, you know, and Sri Aurobindo mother shares, that it is trying to bring out that divinity which is hidden, which got involuted in the process. It got hidden in that dark, thick stone, the matter. You know, that's why we say matter is wailing in nature. It wails. Like, you know, all of us sitting here, nobody knows what's going on in our thoughts. What's the feeling inside? So it wails, you know, the body wails, the matter wails. So no matter, I have still very expressive body, supple movements. Yet there is more yoga to happen so that even the body itself becomes a full manifestation of the divinity. You know, there, there is no possibility to hide anything of the divine. And right now we see many people, you know, and if, they, if we talk to many, many people, you know, in some we can see, wow, you know, divinity shining. In some we are not able to see, oh, why, where can I see Buddha nature in this, this fellow? I can't see. So that's talking about our own selves also, you know, th those people who are too judgmental about our own selves. Where do I see this Buddha nature? I can't see. You know, they say that I have divine nature. So it has got veiled. And the whole yoga or the life's blows or the experiences of life is to mature. And so that this ripening may lead to the divine coming completely to forefront and truly becoming the master of this manifestation, which he is anyway, but right now veiled. So in this aspect, the whole life is a movement of yoga of nature. Nature is trying to, as you know, in Savitri, we have these lines, the two who are one, nature and the Purusha or the God, they are one. You know? Now it appears on the forefront or you know in the by the seeming appearance it appears that nature is blind you know it does just whatever comes to its whims and fancies the words Shirobindo uses in Savitri but again he also reveals it is a very pactful agreement between the Purusha and Prakriti that see we will not tell anyone that we are playing you know and it's an intelligent movement of Prakriti which appears ignorant and the plan is the Purusha will reveal it himself later. And that's what Sri Aurobindo or Mother say, you know, that the psychic being, it ripens through all the experiences of lifetimes. And then you have people who may in their young ages, you know, young ages, they appear to have like so much of maturity and ripening. Where did that come from? You know, so the psychic is in front. The psychic is maturing, has been maturing. And for all of us, you know, each one of us, it's the same process of evolution. Through experiences and assimilations, the psychic ripens. That's the process that was the pact between the two, Purusha and Prakriti. Prakriti was given the first hand. It was said that experiences of life will mold the Purusha. So that the Purusha gains stature, you know, that God within gains stature. So that's why we see in our lives, we are living mostly ignorantly, wandering from here to there, we don't know. And yet the ripening happens. Because the Prakriti has been given the dominant hand, like the ashram, you know, Sri Aurobindo gave the dominant hand to mother, you run the ashram. 
so this is the yoga of nature you know and there is a mutual agreement if one can say mutual since they are again one who appear like two but for saying we say it's a mutual pact in savitri shirobindo say this is the pact that they made so in that sense is the yoga of nature would that uh, resonate with you claudia what you were uh, thinking about yeah a little bit well i don't i'm sorry i don't resonate so much with the theory of evolution but yeah i, I mean like a metaphor yes it's it's good yes uh, and also I, it's like uh we can compare this because i was thinking i study a lot of the chakras and the root chakra for me is very like a stone it's really like a square and have to be very solid and very like very much like a materialistic solid to the roots yes and if we think in the seventh chakra have to be super flexible and it's the more the most open <laughs> a channel to to everything yes so the first chakra is like solid and grounded and cannot be open and have to be very rooted and cannot allow many possibilities so it's like a stone <clears throat> have to be very solid like a stone and the seven chakra have to be flexible like a, an open like with ten thousand petals that accept and allow everything inside all the possibilities so <laughs> i am trying to also to check this inside of my body yes so with this um kind of evolution that we have inside also yes when we go i mean and we all the time need them we all the time need to relate to them because to be connected to all the seven yeah, seven of yeah. it's actually you know i don't know anything about chakras to comment here but uh, it is said in the integral yoga it is said that don't worry about it just leave it to the mother you know, abandon yourself to the mother fully and whatever chakra has to open she knows which one is to be opened right now so in that sense we can be really you know, like a child is with the mother completely relaxed you know mother knows the best so we have been given this golden key because this can get too complicated you know getting us into this chakra science can get very very complicated because we are sticky beings you know we have to remember we are very very sticky we get stuck at each level it's only the mother or a divine name or you know this complete reliance on the divine which takes okay. us forward yeah yeah so yeah i would be wary of uh, this a little and i don't know much about chakras <laughs> thank you for sharing this yeah. I just wanted to add a little bit to what yeah. Claudia was saying, yeah. not going into the details of chakra, but just a simple uh, explanation, Claudia, that if we want to build up anything, our foundation has to be very strong. So even if you have to build up a house, first, the, you know, the, 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 you know, we dig deep enough and we build a strong foundation on which a structure can be built. So as you say that the first chakra, the root chakra, a little bit I know about it. So I'm just gotten tempted to talk. So that is the, you know, that is the foundation. So if we have to work on our own self of evolution from our lower uh, nature, rising up to our higher nature, we have to first firmly establish ourselves. So probably that is what it means that, you know, first you need to have a solid uh, you know, firm ground on which you establish yourself so that whatever storms are there in the life, which is always there, where life is full of challenges, you are able to first firmly ground yourself and then work upon yourself. You have a firm ground to work upon yourself so that whatever happens, we are still not able to be uprooted. We are there and then we keep evolving. Even we keep swaying just as a tree, you know, it keeps swaying even when there is a there is so much of a storm or wind blowing, but some of them are uprooted, some still stay there. So just a simple explanation, if that makes any sense. So that is it. Thank you. Thank you, Priyanka.
so this is what has to be done every moment if we are to walk the path every moment there is a choice ego or divinity now this has to be made many people uh, think you know we since we are thinking beings and we make excessive obsessive use of thinking we think that but i have done this and then over we forget so according to masters and mystics there is never an over we can never say mera ho gaya you know i am done now it's time for others to fix themselves never ever we can say that because they say that as long as there is a body we have the mind we have the feelings so long as there is body the ego is there so be vigilant they say each moment there is a conscious choice that has to be made when we see the ripple of the ego rising who do we give importance to do we listen to the dictate of the ego self the limited ego self or do we take the step forward which step is benefiting me and the other which step is not making me and the other dependent or you know handicap which step is empowering for me and the other and that step we take forward so this has to be done again each moment in our own individual little ways and mother talks about vigilance you know she has said really much about vigilance that we have to be first sincere what movement is there in all honesty to be aware of that movement that is rising in the being and then to be vigilant who do we let in the ego or the divine every moment they i i can't see somehow i personally don't have the experience that this vigilance can be let go of people often ask that do you think that once realized a person can turn back i said i don't know since sri aurobindo talks about there is one realization after that there is another there is another so where do you stop and where do you think that now you know i am done now i can now chill you know bask with the ego and uh, you know my my realization is over i don't know if that point is there so i just know that vigilance has to be there at this moment that's what it comes to me so this has to be done shirovindo shares that integral action of the higher nature working in and by god and unity has to be put forward we have to step back every time from the ego it will be there it will rise his heads head again and again but as somebody was sharing that once we get a taste of this new life not living for that little self once once we get a taste of it then it's easy but before that it's difficult because we take a lot of time to leave our lollipops for what uh, the divine has to offer us we still are in too much love with our lollipops and the little little pleasures that we get stimulations and excitements that are gotten through the ego consciousness that we don't want the true bliss of the divine so it takes time old habits die hard yes and also i think how i get convinced that every time i have to put not the ego forward the god forward in me how i get convinced don't i see how much i suffer don't i see how much others suffer around me when i act from the ego consciousness how long will i continue this torture on me and others so i think out of compassion you know and enough of suffering i out of compassion for my own self now i walk this discomforting path in the beginning it's discomforting but how long will i continue this self torture mother says that most of the misery is self generated so yeah you know if we are done with the amount of suffering we have we can choose every moment if indeed our aim be only an escape from the world to god this is what uh, shirobindo in life divine refers to the ascetic you know the path of the ascetic that if indeed our aim be only an escape from the world to god synthesis is unnecessary 
and a waste of time. So if the only thing that is to be done, being a human being, is to escape into nirvana, as I think Dick was sharing in the beginning, then, uh, you know, that Shirobindo points at it again and again. Then what about synthesis? We don't need to talk about synthesis, you know. Come, do your sadhana, go to nirvana. It's not that easy, <laughs> yet still, you know. <laughs> And we are making it sound too easy, but it's not. For then, our sole practical aim must be to find out one path out of the thousand that lead to God. So again, infinite possibilities, find one way that resonates with you the most and escape to your true self. Leave the world as it is. One shortest possible of shortcuts and not to linger exploring different paths that end in the same goal. So there is no point in exploring different goals, different, sorry, paths, since I resonate with this path and the only thing I have to do is to liberate myself to the spirit. So let me do that. You know, there is no point discussing and synthesizing, he says. But if our aim be a transformation of our integral being, now integral being referring to each part of our complex being nothing remains untouched so the whole thought movement feelings sense perceptions the senses if our aim be a move transformation of our integral being into the terms of god existence it is then that a synthesis becomes necessary so he's very clearly putting it out in front of us that why why am I even talking of synthesis because we don't want to leave the world at, as it is we have done that enough and it is possible for us as he says that it is man has to first from animal man become man and then a divine man so every time an animal instinct rises in me if I still follow the dictate then I'm in that moment, I'm losing the possibility of the God existence, which comes every moment. It's like every moment this is happening. And then he also talks about the method. Yes, Priyanka, you want to go? Uh, Monica, I didn't understand the meaning of synthesis over here. Does it mean evolution? What does it mean? Yes, yes. Let me just uh, talk about maybe these further lines. And maybe it becomes clear or else we talk about it. The method we have to pursue. So synthesizing the materialist says there is no spirit. There is no God. There is only matter. He wants to remain there. The spiritualist or the yoga ascetic says that there is only spirit that can liberate. You know, this matter is an illusion. So these are as if two opposing poles of duality we see. People get stuck in, we get stuck in. But he says, no, no. You know, since in truth, there is a greater unification, greater harmony. So it is possible for the spiritualists and the materialists to be on the same table. So this is the synthesis he is talking of. That we don't have to negate matter. We don't have to negate spirit. Both can be there sitting on one table, having a conversation. They are here for a reason. So then he says that the method we have to pursue for the synthesis to happen then is to put our whole conscious being into relation and contact with the divine. So as if now I am exposing everything to the sun in front of me or the sun within us as Mother shares, you know, to the sadhaks, she would say that, tell me about each of your shadows, don't hide. Because if I don't shed the light on me, on, on these movements, you know, how will they get transformed? So each dark movement, don't be afraid, show it to me. You know, don't give only beauty to me. Once she entered the room of this sadhak, you know, this famous example, and the sadhak had you know, in all the drawers, like fitted all the clothes badly and then looking very neat and clean. And then she goes and she knows what's happening and opens the drawer where it is all filthy and dirty. She says, show this to me. So here he says that if we have to create a synthesis where each part has to become full of light, 
nothing has to remain dark then what is the process to put our whole conscious being into relation and contact with the divine the divine can be you know use you can use several synonyms for the divine the light the clarity within us the love within us you know, this light of consciousness with we see kindness compassion this all are different names for the divine so we have to put everything in connection with this divine and to call him in to transform our entire being to his so this call has to persistently be there just like in shri aurobindo's symbol there is this aspiration human aspiration the ascending triangle and then there is the descending triangle the divine descent if i don't make the call how would the mother know that i need her mother is right here as she shared i am right next to you i am always with you not even next but so far you run the show <laughs> no why do i need to buy a ticket <laughs> so run the show so and that's why the beauty of suffering you know that in our intense phases of suffering we have come very closer to divine it's the experience of all of us you know that experience may fade away gradually since the ego again takes the forward seat front seat so we think now now i am capable why to bother the mother <laughs> so you know this is how it happens that every part consciously has to connect with the divine we have to call upon the divine and so that the divine takes the seat mother you take the seat i don't know again the ego has to say i don't know usually the ego says i know what's the need of mother here so that's why it's good to be unsure of one self which in the moment of difficulty or helplessness we do become unsure that what do i do i do i feel so helpless only then the divine comes forward you know so at least there we give a chance the divine and all knowing and all affecting descends upon the limited so this is the descending triangle in shri aurobindo symbol the divine and all knowing and all affecting descends upon the limited and obscure progressively in stages as we become ready things are shown to us progressively illumines and energizes the whole lower nature and substitutes its own action for all the terms of the inferior human light and mortal activity so i think here it's also seen that who is putting forward my conscious being in contact with the divine i am so the choice the divine is so you know freedom giving to his children he says the choice is with you if you don't want i won't interfere so take as long as you want lifetimes what are lifetimes in eternity nothing take as long as you want but with one call i'll be here and we have all have several examples in our life that whenever we have truly called we have seen the descent happening it's only that we lose vigilance and the divine says okay you seem good enough to go go ahead so he takes the back seat again so this is the vigilance i feel i believe that it's like a constant vigilance and offering and remembering as mother says moment to moment offering and remembering which is required you know mother you take the front seat i think that this is good for me but i don't know so you tell me you tell me so again leaving behind all our likings preferences becoming desireless that's the need of the game because if i say mother i think this is good for me and please help me get this at times mother says that i do actually help you get that so that you know the futility of that but at times i don't grant you that for your own good yeah so anything here i think we can today just take this much and take the rest later anyone wants to share anything here uh, you know the traditional way of 
nirvana it talks about rising above the body right kind of an element of rejection that the body is lowly and you have to ascend upward so i think that is the first thing that was mentioned there that if our aim is just to become him then okay we can just forget everything the transformation the integral healing right the thing that we are right now talking about we, we don't need that right the body just can be looked aside set aside and just question who are you who am i you know just focus on that for example but like you know we were talking about synthesis so now it's not about you rising it's about transforming everything in you like mother worked upon the physical cell transformation it's so easy again you said it's not easy and yet it seems easier to just forget it and move okay you know body inconscient just let's forget about it let's talk about the spirit but that's the rejection so here the difference between say rejection and maybe a compromise and a synthesis a harmonious synthesis that yes all parts of my beings are that and invoking that within that each cell has to be transformed so when that word synthesis that i was talking about that he is in every cell of my being not just the spirit but the material yes absolutely thank you yes you yes, i would add like uh, when we were talking about different paths like hatha yoga or bhakti yoga or or yana yoga you know they they take one aspect of, of you to, to to go to the divine usually this this paths regard the other aspects of ourselves like you know how to deal with that can you put your mic a bit closer uh, to you i think it's better now yeah better better okay. so if for example you are uh, going through a bhakti yoga you will probably have to regard the, the reason and the intelligence as something you don't have to deal with much or you don't have to trust that much but if you are going in a yana yoga uh, path you will look at feelings and emotions like something it's superior maybe something you don't have to trust that so so i guess this has to do with with the synthesis like every aspect of our self has to be taken into account and, and transformed yes beautiful yes yes absolutely yes So as Sri Aurobindo talks about, you know, how illumining the mind, he talks about quieting, quietening the mind so that it becomes capable of receiving the higher knowledge. So as you said that even if the Bhakti Yoga is happening, the mind doesn't have to remain dumb. It, it can become a receptacle for the divine work actively. You know, it doesn't have to just stay in darkness and only the feeling part has to rise, as you said, in Bhakti Yoga. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. So each part can grow and Taru was commenting upon the physical part. So the physical goes to the divine, the, as Mother says, that you invoke in the cells, you inject in the cells that faith, that remembrance, that come on, wake up, you are divine. You know, almost like that, because they're forgotten over centuries. So that waking up in the cells, the waking up in the feelings and the waking up in action and works and intelligence. So that waking up has to happen everywhere. And that's the integral conception of integral yoga or the synthesis that you were talking about. Yes. Yeah, anything else before we end? Anyone?
so just one point is coming to me when i read the last paragraph that we read that mother shares that in one of the ways you know how to go to sleep or how to keep awakening this aspect of the psychic you know the divine in front that every time you go to sleep she shares and also she talks about other methods also that you revise each moment of your day and it should go in front of this psychic as if this light shining in your being and it's screening screening the thoughts you know it's screening the feelings okay is this in alignment with my ideal is this in alignment with my ideal so everything is being checked you know and this is what kabir saint kabir you know he refers to that the guard is always awake that no thought enters or being followed upon that which is coming from the ego side because if we lose the vigilance then the ego thought gets worked upon we follow the dictate of that thought but if there is this vigilance and light of the psychic shining you know in since i want to work on this path now walk on this path transforming my whole nature so everything nothing you know is not moving in front of my eyes that is how conscious one has to be mother shares if we really really want to do this again free will if we don't want to do this right now we don't have to then as mother shares that go through the experiences and take your time yes claudia i just so you don't allow negative thinking yeah you you see the negative thought coming like a ripple you see oh it's arising again but haven't i suffered enough following its dictates so as taru was sharing earlier that you let it be you don't follow the dictate and if you are convinced that its dictates must be followed then of course go ahead no, no nothing can stop us so go ahead and maybe after a few experiences more of following the dictates of those negative ripples then we will become convinced that no next time you know maybe 1001th number of time it arises now i am convinced no 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 you know this time you can't fool me you know 1000 number of times i have followed your dictate now i have understood so through our experiences we become convinced that yes you know enough a different path for me to follow now yeah you know it's something like say if i am lactose intolerant and yet the glamour of the things that are made of milk it's so much but i cannot say i am you know it's not allowed of course it's allowed you know indulge as many times as you want but every time when i'm indulging just seeing what it's doing to my body right and then you don't once you start seeing that and the greed takes a back seat over what it's doing to me then it's not even an active rejection it's just an happening that no no you know it must be there and there are 200 things that i like that are made of milk for example but then it's just a natural you know how they say the leaf just drops from the tree it's ready it doesn't feel like renunciation it doesn't feel like rejection i just you not put it in the body i've seen it enough so allowed or not allowed i think that word sounds a bit harsh right it sounds like not very <laughs> compassionate and kind but we are just talking about simplicity and just seeing the things as they are and just moving forward with that and on the same thing you know how uh, priyanka was talking about the tree and the seed you know when we talk see we only look at a small seed especially if we have ever grown a tree ourselves you know i've seen it's just it's unbelievable that how from that seed which looks lifeless there can be i don't know like 10000 say juicy mangoes coming off or so many leaves and fragrances and flowers so similarly sometimes our own transformation seems like that's not possible for me right like i am this you know what what do i have what do i have 
just this this reminder is so beautiful that just like a seed can become a tree and i see trees all around just my capability my potential is just unimaginable maybe but it's all inside and that invoking will take me there and other thing like whatever we wish to follow invoking i just said one of the ways of course the simplest ones yeah thank you yeah thank you so i think one thing is for sure which comes again and again that if right now a part of me is not convinced that this is the right path for me i must actually follow the direction which feels more compelling if the negative thoughts feel more compelling that i must follow their dictate we must follow because otherwise we are just strangulated in two boats one leg here one leg there nothing growing you know it's like more of a suffering so if right now instead of a satsang the bar attracts me more i must go to the bar because if only then i can be self motivated on the path that if i have now gone to the bar enough no and if my stomach is full you know that and enough of misery has been caused then i will be sure no no you know i know which place to go i am not saying that it's not good to go to bar maybe it is <laughs> i'm just taking it as a reference that yeah if we still feel like what to do what to do i want to do this but see my desires pull me then follow the desire very simple follow no follow follow as long as it eats you up just follow the desire because then you know the suffering that will come <laughs> through following one desire after another desire which is inevitable inevitable that will make me convinced that now i know which path to follow so this conviction comes i feel with the suffering that we go through so uh, monica just now you were sharing you know if we want to go to the you know uh, bar you know for example so why can't we uh, follow the desire why can't we surrender that why can't we ask the mother to transform it no why if you if you can yeah if you can do that i am talking okay. of those of us who can't okay, okay. like that okay. yeah so many a times you know there is like a pull from something mm-hmm. like a very strong attraction that no 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 i have to get this job i have to get this job you know i have to move this place from this place there is a strong call so i am saying that if we are strangulated like in two boats mm-hmm. and we feel that yes getting there will make me give me lasting contentment will make me happy and not walking this path which is right there in front of me then we must follow that desire only because for us to see what happens next then only the true conviction comes but if right now i am in a place that yes the true conviction is there i know that this is beneficial whatever the path is in front of me then there is no there is no need as taru was sharing that it's a natural renunciation you know you say though i i have walked that path enough how long do I, i don't need it i i have better things to do so instead of following the dictate of the desire i have better things to do but i was sharing only for you know states in our life where we feel a strong pull a glitter from this glamour of this world that yes getting that person will make me happy so go run after that person so that we get convinced okay thank you yes sir just a small comment and when say i go to the bar like be the bar become the bar you know what we do is we because we are uh, you know we are on different boats one leg here one leg there even when i am running after desire something in me wants to stop me something in me wants to pull it back right that no 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 yes yes no 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 you know but then if you choose to go then experience it fully that yes this is my key to god maybe let me see this will complete me like then give it your full so that you know it's not it because otherwise in that half yes and half no i feel that okay you know maybe next time i'll go to the bar i you know it will give me something so then there's no 
movement there is no progress you keep on just not being anywhere so be you know like they say that how when for ravan you know from the uh, ramayana the story so for ravan to kill him or to you know transform him ram had to be born you know he was sent that oh so if you have to do something be like be, become extreme somehow balancing is considered very sacred right we keep protecting ourselves to become the ravan so that then also ram will come and he will give you the moksha so just yeah, thank you yeah totally resonates yes so i just got reminded while this discussion is going on i just got reminded of two words in hindi or let's say in sanskrit whatever it is bhog and moksh so bhog that means fulfillment of desires and moksh that is liberation freedom and what is freedom that we are aiming towards you know what is it that liberation that we are talking about we are all bound we are all attached we are all clinging on to something or the other and whatever we are clinging on better better live that because if you are denying yourself uh that experience whatever it is of eating an ice cream or wearing good clothes or maybe living a life that you want to live if because you you've read read something you've been a part of certain discussions and you've understood uh, you know it has come to your it has come to your information it has come to your knowledge that you know these desires are this should be given up and all that but if you try to mentally do it externally renounce it internally if the internal relation still remains you're going to dwell in your thought is going to dwell in you so better whatever what as as monica was just talking about that whatever attraction whatever is attracting you very strongly you are compelling and drawn towards whatever whether to towards a job a profession or to be someone or to uh, whatever live it and that is called bhog live it to the fullest don't deny yourself that and when you live it because that is we have got this body this spirit enveloped in this body why because only with this body there is the senses and the senses are there for us to experience if there wasn't a body there would be no experience so let's say that the divine wanted to experience like i mean i'm just putting it in the layman ter- term that the divine wanted to experience the wanted to drown itself in this world of desires and then this divine is also wanting the purpose is to evolve out of it to rise above it so first it has to it has to live those desires and these are the as just as when you have to reach from the ground floor to the first floor you have to climb from the lowest stair to go up to the highest stair that first stair has to be climbed then second then third then fourth and then you're going to go up when you want to make a very high jump you might just fall meet with an accident so these desires are like that so if whatever it is we are living our nature we are born with an inherent nature and all of us have that is the unique to us and living through it we can rise above it also but first satiate yourself fully all over whatever thirst is there whatever hunger is there but also as you know if you if you if you are totally lost in that then of course you are dipping down towards in the tamogun tamas not that of course we are a part of this discussion i'm not all of us are are into this journey and all of us are at a certain level of awareness so keeping that baseline in place i'm talking about that whatever it is live it and as you live it you will be able to let go. not that you will be able to let go just as taru said just as a, as a leaf falls of itself it will renounce itself automatically there is no external renunciation but the internal change that happens on its own and it happens and you know so then there is that moksha so every minute 
there is a bhog and there is a moksha. It is not the ultimate liberation, the nirvana that I'm talking about. I'm talking about that every minute we can have a bhog and we can liberate ourselves from that and move on, move further, further, further. So this, these two words came to my mind while this discussion was going on. So, yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Priyanka. So Lotus has uh, shared something that would this conscious distancing from unwanted habits also be applicable to an abused spouse who repeatedly goes back to the abuse? So Lotus, do you mean to say that uh, distancing from the one who is abusive? Do you mean to say that, that that will help? I was wondering if um, you just, it, like let's say this is a friend of yours and you can see this happening. Would you not, would you encourage the friend then to go back to the abuse until they finally reach the point of where they've been abused enough that they're gonna say, that's it. And they've got the resolve inside of them. Yeah, yeah. You know, so in these uh, cases, what usually happens that even if I'm suffering because of the abuse with the other person, the vital entanglement is so heavy. The emotional entanglement is so heavy that I still have hope from the other person that no, 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 he will or she will be better tomorrow. And mm -hmm. I, I become so blinded because of that vital entanglement that mm -hmm. I allow the abuse to happen for years. Yes. And I'm not able to dissociate just because I don't lose enchantment from the person. I don't lose hope. And I also, uh, one can say one, one can also say that one doesn't honor oneself enough uh, to say that this is enough. You know, so also, uh, Alokda also points out at one of the articles I remember that many a times, or maybe in one personal anecdote I remember, he says that many a times one has to just like, tha, like, you know, you, it's like a violent separation that helps in many cases because if you gradually, slowly want to get out of each other, it would maybe never happen in this lifetime. And you would allow the abuse to happen to go on because there is vital emotional entanglement with the person. So, this so in other words, you're saying this is different. This is different than what we were talking about before, so, like let's say, bad habits or bad company or something like that. It's because there is an emotion attached to another individual, which makes us totally different. Yeah, it's very interesting that you make this uh, analogy. So what I'm seeing is that if now I look at myself and I see, oh my God, oh my God, haven't I suffered enough following the dictates of these desires? You know, the moment I look at my suffering, and if, if only I have a pinch of love for myself, I would be able to now step back and from that abusive thing, you know, or that abusive habit, which I've been indulging into. But without looking and reflecting upon my suffering, that look, for so many years, I have been following the dictates of this suffering and what mess I have made of myself. How long would I want this to continue? So I think this looking at oneself having a little pinch of love for oneself that, you know, I don't want to do this to myself anymore. I would say that would be an analogy in both the cases that once I know that enough of suffering, mm -hmm. not suffering anymore. And this also happens in cases like you said that, you know, if I have a partner who is abusive, there are cases where we hear that the women decides, as most cases women, he, she decides that, you know, enough. This day, you know, whatever can be the reason for leaving the house, you know, it, but maybe one is waiting for now, you know, he slapped me on my face. Now this is enough. So reason could be enough and he may have slapped you enough times on the face, you know, that's a different thing. But one day that resolve comes that this is enough. And then one just, cha, you know, it's like a very violent separation, which helps usually in most of the cases. 
owing to the fact that this gradual slowly you know coming apart and making trying to resolve things that almost in most cases is not seen to work because the person gets back to the abuse it's hard to change the nature so that's what is my reflection here i don't know mm -hmm. yeah thank you thank you I think one thing that I saw in Lotus's question was that she asked that what would you tell your friend? Would you ask your friend to go back and keep doing it till it's enough? I think what came to me was that no, I would tell them to get out. But your point was that they will not get out till they feel they are done. So as a friend to myself or anybody else, I would be like run right run but there also we have seen that there is some greed right there is something that you are still getting some comfort some name some protection financial stabil stability that we feel that okay you know i'm paying a price but i'm getting this 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 but as a friend i would say enough right like honoring that you were talking about so then i would not say that yes but i could Think that to you know bring so days to myself that yes you know she will get out when she has had enough. I pray that it happens you know right away and but my thing would be a push towards okay get out get out get out get out slowly loudly whispering shouting if I am asked and if I see something that needs to be said. So. Yeah, so I, I just wanted to say that for each one of us, this, this, this point, this breaking point is different. So each one of us, when we are ready to break and to, you know, to come out, to, to come out of that, it varies. And uh, <laughs> yes, as a friend, we are always going to suggest, but it is always better to ask what you want, because Eventually, it is that person who has to figure out, yes, we can support, we can give our own suggestions, we can be there, you know, in the background and always giving our opinions, our suggestions, always protecting, always being there. But it is always also, you know, that person will walk, walk its own path, its own journey, take its own time. And for each one of us, it's going to be different till we are ready from within ourselves. Even if under sometimes under pressure, under influence of, let's say, family or friends, if we are able to do it, we carry our mind always with us. If, if, if our internal attachment, if some kind of thing is still there, then sometimes it, it also creates, you know, if, if those karmas are not worked out, we tend to go back because eventually we have to work it out and we find our own ways and yes we have we need to have a supportive environment and as friends and family we'll keep suggesting and doing what we what we think is right but it is best left to the person to decide you know from within and to break, break free from whatever the situation is that's what i feel yeah yeah for me it's like i i have believe i have um many experiences about different kind of relationships with human beings <laughs> and yeah i kind of uh, know how passion can get cling to others and also to be an abuser have to be someone that likes to be the victim so one have to observe and one have to say it's enough it's enough for me to be the victim i think i i finish you know i finish with this role but until you don't finish that role then even if you go out from the abuser you will find another abuser in your life you will still be in the victim in your life so you have to work with that mentality and you have to to go deep into the shadow to understand what is happening there and it's what i love 
what do you say about to go into the passions and to live it, to live the experience? So you have to, to say, okay, I like to be the victim. What is to be the victim? You have to, to bring the light there, yes? And unfortunately, we cannot do the work for, the, for other people. We can maybe suggest, we can maybe show a little bit the light, but if they don't want, if they don't have the will, if they don't have a, anything in them that want to go out to work, we cannot do anything, anything at, at all. So just pray maybe and send in light. But yes, I think um, it's, I mean, it's always important to observe it and to, to be there. And sometimes a pray can help, yes, but I mean, we cannot do anything. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. And I think one thing which we can do definitely uh, living all of our experiences as you know, everyone was sharing that just developing a better taste, giving our joy more importance in life, not comp because we compromise on our joy. Every day we compromise in the name of the day to day activities in the name of what needs to be done in the name of duties responsibilities we daily we are compromising on our joy and if we honor this joy within you know, that the delight which is the basis of existence then it is very hard for one to continue being in an abusive relationship whether in in terms of following the dictates of desires because we see the harm that we do and now I honor myself so much that uh, I don't want to have that little joy that comes by following the desire. I, since I partake of a greater joy that comes from stepping back from a desire. So again, developing a different taste, you know, a higher taste as mother says, that develop a higher taste. You know, when a desire is fulfilled, it's a very lasting, very little contentment that we get. And then another one arises, another one arises. You know, but if we develop, if we dwell in the divine and make it a practice to dwell in the divine, then the taste we get is so high a taste, then who would want to follow the taste of desire? desire? You know, who would want that? So I think it's better for us to get a higher taste because if I negate the lower taste, since I don't have joy in my life, desire at least brings some joy. You know, I would not be able to give it up like that just like that so parallelly one has to practice dwelling in the divine within you know having a beautiful intimacy with oneself one's own divine so that one gets a higher taste a loftier taste and one doesn't need to follow the passions or dictates of desires anymore so this parallel movement has to happen alongside experiencing and getting convinced that the desire where do they get me totally getting convinced there Parallelly, a higher taste has to get developed so that I lose the total disenchantment, as we say, you know, that desires lose any enchantment for me. They don't have any enchantment anymore because I have something greater in which I dwell. So that true joy, inner joy, if that can be cultivated parallelly. Yes. That's, that's very, very rightly said, Monica, because if you keep on dwelling into desires, you'll be drawn more and more into the darkness, into ignorance. That mm. is not what we are aiming towards. That, mm. you know, when, I, when we say that, yes, live your desires, it doesn't mean you get totally entangled and drown into that, because then you, it, you will be, we will be bringing in more miseries. It again will creating a vicious cycle of more and more and more and more. And, and then we are, you know, we are, but yes, to also, at the same time, to have this balance about bringing the light while leaving the desires, always making the mind dwell in, in the thought of God, that light that we talk about, the divinity that we talk about, so that our desires automatically fall off and we are you know, pulled up, transformation happens. 
So I heard you say that really it's a two-pronged approach in this particular case. Yes, just like in addiction, Lotus, just like we, when we are addicted, say I have uh, addiction to maybe a drug or food you know, or anything, we get addicted, we are addicted to relationships, we are addicted to our own thoughts, opinions. So any frame of addiction we can take as an example. So if now I want to de-addict myself, owing to the fact that I see how much suffering it causes me, how much bad health it is giving me, what will I do? I can't sit in front of cigarettes thrown all around and say, no, 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 I'm not taking you today. You know, that won't work. What I have to do parallelly is by alongside saying no to the cigarettes, cigarette means desires, alongside saying no to cigarettes, I have to develop a higher taste. So that's why in rehabilitation centers where de-addiction happens, they engage the people who are getting de-addicted in activities which are nurturing for their soul. So maybe pottery, you know, maybe something they like sports, you know, something they haven't touched in years, maybe drawing, painting. So parallel rehabilitation and yes, you know, that, that is what I meant that it's like a two way approach alongside saying no, this is not healthy for me. I just that won't work. Parallel dwelling in something higher, which gives me that delight, which I was craving from that addiction, even a greater delight, which is healthy for me, a healthy delight. That is what has to be cultivated. So yes, yeah. Just like we do with de-addicting and rehabilitation. We give ourselves a better job so that our energies are channelized. You know? Now I don't even have time to attend to my desires, you know, something like that. That look, mother has given so much work that yes, the desires may be there. Yeah, they, if I attend to them, yes, they are there lurking behind the corner. But who has time? You know, look at the work we have in front. So almost like that. Something more, as mother says, an aimless life, life is always a miserable life. And depending upon the quality of our aim will be the quality of our life. So like that, we move ahead. Great, so yeah, Claudia has shared a link here to watch. If anyone wants, maybe you can copy it from the chat window. Yeah, thank you so much, Claudia. Okay, victim identity, yeah, thank you. Great. So thank you everyone. Thank you for staying uh, till the last time moments. And thank you for a very reflective discussion. Thank you. Thanks for joining. Thanks everyone. Thank you, Monique. Thank you.